Hey guys, you know what month it is. Sphere Timber! The month when everyone in the Sphere community shows off cool stuff using their Sphere computers. Here's a list of all the retro YouTubers doing Sphere videos this Sphere Timber! Maybe next year. For today though, I am going to show some more Sphere, following on in the series we've been doing. You'll get a tour of the full, complete, assembled Sphere computer, a demo of how to run BASIC on this beast, and finally, I'll reconstruct the funky paper punch tape Sphere print shop program that I exhibited at the Vintage Computer Festival West this past summer, 2023. Along the way, you'll get a peek at some brand new modern retro hardware I designed to make the Sphere more flexible and reliable than it was in the 70s. Let's get going. If you're new to this channel, the Sphere was an important but very obscure early microcomputer, launched in 1975 out of Bountiful, Utah. Mike Wise designed it, and it showed up a few months after the Altair, but before pretty much anything else, including the Imzai, the Apple I, the Soul 20, etc. I'm working on a book about the Sphere computer, company, and community, and if you'd like to know more, or have personal experiences or materials you'd like to share, please do get in touch at sphere.computer. The Sphere was a modular system, and in earlier videos we basically built one up from its core boards. Today we're jumping right to the final version. Here it is, a Sphere computer in all of its painted sheet metal glory. There's not much to see from the outside besides the keyboard and the built-in 9-inch display, which is hiding behind that smoked acrylic panel. The acrylic is not so much anti-glare as glare positive, so I have to film it at an angle. This original keyboard is new to us, so let's take a look. It's a pretty standard 1970s ASCII keyboard, with some special keys, including a backspace, line feed, uh, clear, and repeat. The keys use clicky high-tech switches. The unique Sphere Edition is a pair of blank unlabeled keys at the corners. If you press both of these at the same time, that's how you trigger a soft reset of the system. This was an innovation that Sphere was really proud of. You needed two hands so you couldn't do it by accident, but it was still conveniently located, where your hands are. Turning the system around shows us the guts of what's really going on. First of all, all these wires. I'm still using the old Apple power supply to run the computer. Here's the original power cable pigtail that would have connected to a huge linear power brick. But then there's this other cord, and this is for the built-in monitor. Which is like a totally separate thing, but more on that shortly. Over on the left is the card cage, holding the Sphere computer boards. This is the same setup as we saw previously, except now it's mounted inside this box. The CRT tube is bolted to the front panel with its electronics mounted below. The connection to the monitor is actually just a standard connector coming from the computer's CRT board. This case design is not very friendly, and removing the cover requires either unbolting the tube from the front panel, or disconnecting the CRT neck, yoke connections, and high voltage anode cap, yikes, before being able to lift the cover off. I actually prefer that approach, so I spliced in a connector for the yoke leads to make it easier, but I do have to discharge the tube first. Don't try this at home. Here's the cover off, and now we can see more clearly what's going on, which is not that much. The power supply is external, so all we have here are the boards on one side, the monitor on the other, and the keyboard in front. The keyboard is wired into the CPU with a ribbon cable, just like we saw before, and the CRT board output plugs into a jack in the monitor section. A word about that monitor. If this looks like the guts of a retail video display bolted into this case, that's because it is. Sphere used the popular 1970s Sanyo monitors that you often see paired with very old computers. They removed the casing and just screwed the electronics and the tube into the Sphere chassis. That's why it has a separate power connection and its own internal input jack. The adjustments for brightness and contrast are still there, but they're pointed downwards through holes in the bottom of the chassis. The boards are the same three we saw before, the CRT board, the CPU board, and the SIM serial board. But today there's a new fourth one, and it's a memory board. The reality is that the built-in 4K just isn't enough to do that much with, like load a decent basic or run complex software. Most Sphere users had a 16K expansion card called the MEM1. It used up to 32 dynamic RAM chips in 4K banks to bring a system up to a respectable 20K total. I have one of these boards, but it's got some real downsides. First of all, these early DRAM chips can fail just by looking at them. The failures are hard to detect, and these chips are difficult and expensive to replace. Secondly, see these four massive resistors? 
They're using the address selection logic and they burn tons of power and radiate heat when the board is powered. The heat makes the memory less reliable. You can see here someone used aluminum foil to shield some capacitors from the heat. The power consumption can also wreak havoc with power rail stability in the rest of the system. So this is my own solution to all these problems. A new retro vintage style memory board with a single static RAM chip and selectable addressing. I call it the MEM6 with the 6 for 64K, the maximum addressable memory in the 8-bit sphere. This one board replaces up to four MEM1 boards, which no one really had anyway. Uh, it basically consumes no power, and you can use these dip switches to enable or disable each 4K address range. This board has everything enabled except for the first 4K, which is handled on the CPU board, and the last two starting at address E1000. The video memory and the ROM are located in the top 8K, so this setting basically fills in all the available address space with usable RAM. The board also includes a set of terminating resistors to reduce noise on the data bus. Put all back together, the system boots up the same as it did before, of course. For the sake of a watchable video, I'm just going to remove the acrylic panel so we can see the screen better. I'm sorry, I know it looks less cool when it's naked. We can open the built-in assembly editor and type stuff here, of course, but with a full complement of memory to use, we can load BASIC. So let's do that now. This is a version of Microsoft's BASIC for the 6800 processor. Sphere had their own BASIC, but it was not great, so Sphere users tended to use pirated or patched versions from other systems that also used the Motorola 6800 processor. Microsoft's BASIC, which started out on the Altair, was excellent and quickly became the industry standard. So I took a full Microsoft BASIC originally sold for the Southwest Technical Products 6800 and ported and patched it to work on this Sphere. It takes about five minutes to load from cassette and requires at least 10K or so of memory, so that new memory board is critical for what comes next. Once it loads, you get the standard startup prompts asking about memory size and terminal width. I press return here to use defaults and then say yes to trigonometry, and here we are in the classic basic environment, but on the sphere. You can type in a program, and unlike the more alien environment of the Sphere native PDS firmware, BASIC feels contemporary and works just like every other BASIC. BASIC programs typed in from newsletters or books or magazines were a huge part of early microcomputer home use. Here's David Ahl's very famous and best-selling book of BASIC games from the late 70s. You would think this was such a great deal at the time. You'd only pay eight bucks for the book and spend like a million hours typing in game programs so the games are basically free? Anyway, games was a loose word for some of these programs. Microsoft's BASIC supported cassette, save, and load, and I've connected those commands to the corresponding Sphere hardware. I took the liberty of typing in in advance one of the book's programs, the game called Dice. It's less a game and more a sort of statistics simulation. We can load it off this CompuTape cassette, that I have already saved it onto. We type C load dice, press enter, start the tape, and wait a bit. When it's loaded, the OK shows back up. If we list the program, we can see that it's there. Let's run it. It wants to know how many times to roll the dice, and it's just going to create a histogram of the different roll totals that it finds using its random number generator. Uh, so if we do more rolls, we're going to get a more accurate distribution of dice values. There you go. Dice rolls. Cool stuff, man. Great game. Anyway, that's BASIC, brought to you by Bill Gates and a bunch of loader patches and aftermarket RAM boards. If you have a sphere and you want to buy one of these RAM boards, go check out sphere.computer slash shop for more information. I have some extra boards and I make up a neat retro package, including a Xerox manual and a test program cassette. Anyway, let's move on to the main event, a demo of the Sphere controlling a paper tape punch to do fun tricks. I brought this computer and this hardware to the Vintage Computer Festival West this past summer, along with my co-exhibitor, Larry. This is a paper tape reader and punch used for data storage on one inch wide paper tape. Normally the paper tape looks like this, 8-bit binary, one byte to each row, used for binary data. But that is not what we'll be doing. Here's the machine we've got, a GN Telematic 4604, a late model, high speed paper tape reader and punch from Denmark. This unit is from the 80s or 90s, it's newer than the Sphere and indeed would never have been mated to a computer system for data storage. This would have been used in a machine shop to control milling equipment, where punch tape programs were relevant much later than they were in computers. 
On the left is the optical paper reader. On the right is the punch mechanism. I have a durable mylar tape installed instead of actual paper. The full roll is spooled out from back here and it feeds through the punch with the output coming off the front. On the side is a box to catch all the little punched out confetti. When we turn it on, we can push the leader button to get a few inches of zero byte blank tape. The top side of the mylar is blue and the bottom is silver. Paper and mylar tape is no longer manufactured, but it came in a wide variety of colors. How are we gonna hook this up to the sphere? Fortunately for us, this machine operates over a standard RS-232 serial connection, and the sphere serial board has a spare port on it that we can configure for RS-232. To connect the two, I had to make yet another bespoke cable. This one connects to the DB25 serial port on the GN telematic, and only uses three signals, transmit, receive, and common, or ground. Those signals connect to, bingo again, a 14-pin connector for the sphere side. Here's what that looks like plugged into the SIM board in the socket above the cassette connection. I also had to set various jumpers on the board to configure the RS-232 port. Let's fire it all up. I wrote this program in assembly language called Sphere Print Shop. It's an homage to the 1980s print shop program for apples because it lets you print little human readable banners using the punch tape. I encoded three different typefaces as bitmap fonts. The first one is named for Tom Pittman, an engineer who developed some of the letter forms for his tiny basic program tapes, including one that he sold for the Sphere. The second is Chicago, the most iconic Macintosh font designed by the legendary Susan Kerr. The last one is just a cute small cap style that puts all the letter forms on one side of the feed hole line. Let's make a banner. Start with Pittman, we'll type in a message. Then it asks us which side to punch on. Remember, the mylar has different color on each side, and depending on how the letters are punched, it will only be legible from one direction. So let's use the blue side. We can try Chicago and print out, I don't know, Chicago, this time on the silver bottom side. Our final trick will show off the small caps with a useful bit of marketing. This was a really well-received interactive exhibit at the Vintage Computer Festival. It was a fun way of letting people interact with a very early microsystem that was more interesting than demonstrating a mini assembler. And that's all we have for today. We've seen how the Sphere looked and worked when it was a complete assembled system. We saw how I added a stable RAM expansion so we could do more interesting stuff with it. We loaded Microsoft's Basic from cassette and played a super fun dice game. And we relived the glory of the VCF West show. Thanks for watching, and as always, please feel free to get in touch. My contact information is on my Sphere site, and you can sign up for book updates or subscribe here for future Sphere videos. Thanks for watching. Sphere Timber!